My name is Anthony Fatsies and welcome to the What The Finance podcast, where we interview finance, trading and investing experts to help you understand current market trends and learn about the intricacies of new and existing assets. If you enjoy the podcast and to help with the YouTube algorithm, please like, comment and subscribe. It really helps with the podcast and it means we can continue to get amazing guests. Thanks again. I hope you enjoy. Costas, thank you so much for joining the What The Finance podcast to talk with me today. Uh, so sort of on to my first question, can you talk about your experience and how you became interested in the link between behavioral finance, uh, sorry, behavioral science and finance? Sure. So thanks for the invitation. Uh, so I guess it all started, I did my undergraduate degree in economics. So, and I was always, I mean, I quite like, you know, the combination of math and, 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 and social science. So sorry about that. And, um, mm-hmm. So, but, but what, what really like fascinated me is the fact that we, we studied all these beautiful sort of theories that mathematically made the world look such an organized place and they all made sense. And then when we looked at empirical evidence, there was always, you know, the empirical evidence were not really ever so clear. So the mapping between evidence and theory was not always so clear and we didn't really have like good answers. Like, okay, so the theory doesn't seem to hold. So, you know, what happens? So for a long time, you know, this was the situation doing theory, then, then evidence that don't quite fit with the theory. And then we did one course that was called methodology in economics that touched upon the issue of bounded rationality. So then that got me really, really fascinated. I liked how, um, you know, the psychology of the decision maker can actually influence what obviously they are doing and can provide an explanation for some of the anomalies, let's say, that we observe in, in markets and how and how people behave. So, but that was just one module. I was really like fascinated, but it was only one module. So then I finished my degree and then I moved on to do a, a master's degree. And I was really happy to see that the, the behavioral finance sort of um, aspect. So the bounded rationality aspect of finance was really developed. So there was a lot of studies talking about psychology. And I was fortunate to also have a lecturer who had a keen interest. His research was about that. So he exposed us to some of this stuff. And then I got you know really fascinated the fact that you could actually tell something about human behavior by observing financial markets. So that was for me like a very nice kind of environment, you know, where you can actually apply economics, do data analysis, there was a bit of math and so on, but there was a psychology sort of component. So that's what got me interested in in, in, um, in behavioral stuff. And then in my PhD, I did more research on this and I have been doing this basically uh, all, this, all this time. So I haven't worked. As a, as a trader or in a bank or anything like that. So my knowledge is my experience is more from the academic side, but uh, yeah, that is how I got into the, into the field. Yeah. It's really interesting. And do you sort of see, um, as you said there, that, you know, you, you only really have one module in your undergraduate and then in your sort of postgraduate is more, do you think that might, might be sort of a weakness maybe sometimes that they don't focus as much on the behavioral, behavioral side of things. It's all just theory. A lot of it. I think that um, I think that's true. I think uh, we can do more. I think in all levels of education, undergraduate, postgraduate, I think we can, you know, teach these behavioral ideas a little bit more. But I think now many universities are, are offering this type of courses. For example, I am teaching one in the postgraduate uh, degrees that, that that we do here is a master's level course, and I'm also trying to organize a full course in the undergraduate uh, suite but in in the course that I teach in the undergraduate there is I do have some lectures where we talk about behavioral stuff so students do get some exposure so I think to answer your question I think universities are now teaching this field a lot more compared to what they were doing when I was let's say an undergraduate in you know early 2000s uh, but I think we can still perhaps uh, do a bit more yeah, and I guess everything's changing so quickly. There's always it's always going to be a little bit slower to to catch up, isn't it? That's true. Yes, that's true. I think that's and I guess we'll come back to this. But you know, the problem with behavioral finance is that it doesn't really have a core theory that, as you say, always applies that you can learn. It's a field that is always in flux. You know, now you know this, then you know that, then you sort of change what you think. So you know, when you allow for human psychology into the whole thing it becomes a little bit messy. And I think that is why people are a bit reluctant to sort of teach it or even write textbooks about it, you know? So, and that is a factor, I think that is holding it a little bit back in at least the undergraduate, postgraduate sort of area. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. And I guess you could say it's so results driven that, you know, everyone's looking for that arbitrage where they can take advantage of, and then, you know, it only lasts for a little bit and then it, it stops and then it just keeps moving and moving in that direction, doesn't it? Yeah. So it does uh, mean that, you know, whether there is arbitrage opportunities to be, to be, to be made. I mean, that is, that is one issue uh, um, that, that, that relates to behavioral ideas, but in general, understanding how investors behave is important. Understanding the things that influence their performance, the things that influence their decisions, even an, even arbitrage opportunity is not allowed in the sense that there is some people that always understand that there is some mispricing and they exploit it so fast that it goes away. Still, it's interesting to understand why those investors in the first place behaved in the way that they did. Because obviously that influenced their performance. So from a welfare point of view, it's important to understand why they did what they did. And hopefully one day we can actually better educate people to make better, better decisions. So that's why you say it's important. So we can hopefully in the future, you know, have better decisions in, in finance. I think that's the main thing that the 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 that behavioral finance can contribute to ultimately is to help people realize the mistakes that they do and try to avoid them. And also from an investment management point of view, as you say, perhaps you know some some portfolio managers are keeping track of all these things in order to 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 make returns. So it is also important from, from you know for that point of view. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm sure you get lots of questions about it. It's quite an interesting topic. Uh, what would you say are the most common misunderstandings about the space? Um, misunderstandings, you mean the m mistakes people do or, or misunderstandings on how people perceive behavioral finance? Maybe perceive, you could say like the myths of behavioral finance, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So what I do read in the media sometimes is that, you know, sometimes things are very portrayed in black and white, you know, so it's either all psychology or no psychology, you know, or, or, or something like this. So I, I would, I would say that that is not entirely true. So it doesn't mean that even if you allow for some sort of mistakes to happen it doesn't mean that the market is just totally inefficient and everything is just priced according to psychological whims all the time so sometimes people may portray market as being as this a crazy environment that you know prices just go up and down with no meaning but you know i don't think that is why i think a lot of it is you know the way incentives are structured and the pricing of information and all these kind of things but in, in but in some conditions also psychology matters so I would say that is something that perhaps I don't agree hundred percent with the fact that, you know, people say, or sometimes in the media, you read that, you know, it gives the idea that the stock market is just one big casino and it's not entirely like that. Yeah. Yeah. And you could say that sort of, we've seen that more often now with the emergence of, you could say, you know, stock market anomalies such as AMC and GameStop mm -hmm. where that's that, you know, they, they imply that that's, that's all that happens. There's nothing else <laughs> that happens in the market. Yeah, yeah. So the market is to a large extent, you know, working the way it should be. But sometimes, you know, psychology becomes relevant. So, you know, understanding those conditions is important. Yeah. And like um, I mentioned AMC and GameStop there, there before. So sort of how do you think these anomalies are, you know, does this show that the dynamics of the market are changing? Maybe there's more retail investors coming in who, are, who might not, you know, might yeah. be a bit more emotional. What's your perspective on that? So I think what happened with uh, with GameStop and AMC is quite interesting because it does show a, a, a new dynamic. So I don't consider it to be a fully sort of irrational behavioral thing what happened. I think just some people got organized and they tried to uh, squeeze uh, institutions, right? So they tried to, and it was all in the spirit of like, you know, what is fair and what is not, you know, it was kind of this uprising that you see not just in the stock market, I think in society as a whole, there is this uprising against the establishment, right? Like I think, you know, for example, the elections in the US more recently, you know, when Trump went to power and Brexit and, you know, the Wall Street movement, I, I forgot what the name of it was now, but, uh, all these things are just showing some unrest, you know? And I think this unrest in this case was manifested in this way. So people got organized and they tried to hurt institutions in some way, right? Because they thought that, you know, it is not, you know, what's happening is not fair. So they tried to show that, you know, people also have some power, right? And I think it's um, interesting in that it shows that it is possible. I mean, I have seen, you know, there's lots of studies now analyzing. So what kind of risk does this create for institutions, right? Because it does create a risk. If you're taking a big short position, 
on some asset that is perhaps not so liquid and you're facing this type of thing, you stand to lose a lot of money as it happened, right? With, with, mm -hmm. with GameStop, for example. So um, it is a new dynamic and which is also facilitated by the technologies that are available, you know? So people trade on these platforms that allow this to happen. People can get organized on this Reddit and all these kind of other rooms that they can just get together and chat and all this kind of stuff. So it is, a, an, a, it makes the marketplace a lot more interesting, I think. The fact that you know uh, this could could happen. Yeah, and do you think this will be something that will continue to happen in the future, or do you think regulation? Well, I, I guess that's the issue. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it would, to what extent they can regulate this kind of thing? I don't think that people can regulate people getting together and saying, "Let's all go buy this stock." Right? I don't think they can allow this. You know, they can regulate against this thing. I mean, it was a combination of things. It was also like the lockdown. People were at home for a long time. I guess they were bored. So this gave them something exciting to do, you know? So whether it continues in the future, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure. I don't think it will, is my personal uh, opinion. I think it's just something that happened in this particular case. All the conditions were right for this kind of thing to happen. Whether it's going to be a systematic thing, I personally doubt it, but, you know, have to wait and see. Yeah, definitely. I think it's it'll be interesting to see if uh, if it happens again. But um, w w sort of, I'm sure there's lots of findings that you have that you see in the space that you think maybe more people should know about. Um, can you maybe talk about that? And what what do you think are maybe some underrated findings in the space? Right. So, um, so I guess you're asking me uh, the way that I understand your question is like uh, we're talking about behavioral finance. Like, what are the main things that individual investors could take into account? Yes. Exactly. The, the, yeah, okay. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that, but if I had to summarize the, the, the two main things is the, the first thing is that many people do not invest, do not participate in the stock market at all. And I think this is the biggest um, contributor to, uh, that has a negative outcome in people's welfare. It's the most important thing, in my opinion. And the reason is because people, you know, don't understand the stock market, think that, oh, the stock market is so complicated, stocks, I don't know anything about stocks, so I'm just going to stay away from stocks, right? So what do you do? You take your savings and you put them in some savings account that gives you now zero interest, right? And over a long period of time, this matters greatly, okay? So if I'm now, let's say, 35 years old, I have 10, 15,000 that I know I'm not going to need for a while. Right? It's, not, it's not money that I need to pay my mortgage. It's not money that I need to pay my car loan. It's not money that I need to pay my student loan. It's just savings that I have, right? So what do I do? I put them in a, in a you know, low interest sort of instrument that gives me, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40 basis points per year, something like this, right? Is what, is what they pay. However, if I had chosen to put this money into the stock market in some diversified uh, instrument like the market index, for example, that is, I will pay very low fees because there's no management in that mm -hmm. product. And then I'm going to get the equity premium, which on average is like five, six percent per year. Now, six percent versus 40 basis points is a big difference, especially when you account that, you know, you're going to be in this position for 10, 15 years. So the compounding is going to have a very large effect. OK, so that I think is the biggest mistake people do, that they do not participate in, in the stock market. And in some sense, people think that the stock market is a riskier place than what it is. Because if you look, if you, if you expand your horizon and you allow your horizon to be 20 years, there's very little 20 year periods, if any, that the stock market did worse than the bond market, let's say. OK, so you can observe if you observe the stock market on a daily basis, of course, it goes up and down all the time. Right. But if you just say, OK, I'm just going to park my money into this ETF, which just tracks, you know, the UK economy or just or, or it's just an ETF that tracks the, the, the G8, let's say. Right. And I leave my money there for 20 years. On average, you're going to get, you know, the equity premium that is six percent per year, unless, you know, some third you know, world war happens, right? A, a very extreme event. Yeah. But on average, you can expect to make a return that is much bigger. But because people think, uh, you know, oh, the stock market is very risky, goes up and down, whatever, I'm not going to participate. That is a, a big cost. I would say the, the vast majority of the population have money that they could put in the stock market because it's not, um, you know, it's just savings that 
you know, they, they don't really need for their day-to-day -day, uh, sort of stuff. Um, but they choose not to do it and they lose a lot of money. The opportunity cost of staying out of the, of the stock market is high. So that's the, I, I think the biggest thing, okay? The biggest thing. The second thing is that for those people that do decide to go in the stock market, they do, in the, they do it in the wrong way. So they will invest in like, they start stock picking and day trading. And these things invariably don't lead to returns, okay? Basically the evidence show that on average, people buy high and sell low. Yeah. The people that do this type of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the mistake that people do is that I think, you know, the average person at least thinks that, you know, it's easy to beat the market. It's easy to find assets that are undervalued or overvalued, so I try to exploit them. And in fact, it's not easy at all, okay? Especially for, you know, retail investors who do not have the time or the knowledge to actually analyze all the stuff and come up with some strategy that actually makes sense. So, you know, trading on rumor and trading on, you know, what is written in the media and what is written in social media platforms and all this kind of stuff, I, I, I think is very unlikely to lead to good returns. So the two big mistakes with uh, that people uh, are, are these, in my view, not participating in the stock market. And if they do, they participate in the wrong way. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, it, it, it's a common trend that I'm seeing from all the people I interview. It's like, you know, at least participate and obviously, you know, put, put it in a, in an index, as you said. And then, you know, if you want to, essentially stock pick, put the time and put a year in and then just put a small percentage of your portfolio. I think that's but, sort of what I'm saying a lot of people say. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good. Uh, so, that you know, of course you can stock pick if you want to, but, you know, devote a small amount of money to that. Do it slowly over time and see, is your skill good? If you, you know, if you're getting returns right, keep doing it. If not, you, you know, you're not, uh, maybe you should just not do it anymore. Yeah, definitely. So, I'm sure there's been lots of studies in, in the space. What would you say are the most interesting studies you have seen recently in, in behavioral uh, finance? Well, one sort of common uh, um, theme in many kind of studies that have come out recently is the fact that people's experience influences their decisions, okay? Whereas in, in a traditional sort of finance setting, you're going to learn, okay, we're going to study what the fundamentals are, and then we're going to make decisions based on those fundamentals, right? So I'm going to get data. I'm going to calculate what the, uh, you know, equity premium is. I'm going to calculate what the betas of the, you know, the stocks are and so on. And then, and then uh, I'm going to, I'm going to make some decision, but it seems that the, the, the finding that comes out is that people's experience shapes their expectations. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can think of people's experience as more or less a random thing, right? It's like, let's say I was in the market uh, longer than you. Okay, obviously, I'm going to have a different experience than you, right? Mm -hmm. So if I was in the market when there was a boom, and then you sort of missed this boom, but you came in the market afterwards, you're going to have different expectations than I do. Okay, mm -hmm. so and particularly, I'm going to be much more optimistic, aggressive investor compared to you, just because through some chance event, I entered the market at a different place. Okay, so that is something that investor, you know, it's like you should look a little bit broader from your own experience, like the very few stocks that you have in your portfolio and try to see equities or assets from a more, from a more, from a broader perspective, which is what, you know, we teach what finance theory says that you should be doing. So, but, but there is a lot of evidence to show that people's experience does influence how they, 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 they see things. And even, for example, like owning something, you, the expectations for that asset that you own is going to be different than the expectation you have about some asset that you do not own, even let's say these assets are completely the same. So the, 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 the difference, the fact that just because you own something, it could make you more, uh, you know, more optimistic towards it. Yeah. Okay. So, so that that is something that is sort of coming out from many different papers that people's personal experience matters in the in the decisions that they make and of, and and often makes them uh, make a decision that perhaps is not the best. Yeah. So you'd say that people you know are potentially more irrational. You'd say when these things happen or. No, I wouldn't say irrational. I would just say that your decisions depend a lot on your on your own experience, which is. It can be a random thing, right? So, for yeah. example, one classic study in this field shows that people that have experienced in their lifetime better market stock market returns put more money in the stock market. Now, of course, the, you, 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 let's say 
at, at, at the same point in time, you find that I put more money in the stock market than you do. Let's say we are exactly the same person, right? Like have the same wealth, have the same education, have the same everything, except that I have been in the stock market uh, for a different period than you. And my experience of the stock market is better, right? Now, of course, our experience does not give you any information about what the stock market is going to do later on, right? So uh, the, the objective information about the market is the same for both of us, right? Mm -hmm. So if we were making decisions in a rational way, you should find that we do, we're doing the same thing today because we are exactly a copy of each other, except that we have different experience in the past. But different experience in the past tells you nothing about what the market is going to do later, right? But the fact that I put more money into the stock market compared to you means that you know, there is something wrong in the decisions that we take. Somehow our expectations or perhaps risk attitude has been shaped by our own experience, which is idiosyncratic. Yes, so uh, I would say that you know, people should look beyond their own experience, try to look at the data from a more, from a more broad perspective, not just look your own individual portfolio and try to make a big decision about, you know, what the stock market is going to do based on just your limited experience. Yeah, I agree. And I guess that's where, you, you know, you link it back to what you said before about black and white. And sometimes, you know, that's what some people want to say. They just want to separate it by this is, sorry, this is right. This is wrong. Whereas mm -hmm. there's so much, you know, you could say gray in between um, that really impacts the decisions that people make. Yes. So, and it seems that, you know, personal experience is one, uh, one such thing. Perfect. So, what we've really seen over the past, you could almost say 20 years, maybe you know, 13, 14 years since uh, the recession in 2008 is unprecedented quantitative easing. Um, so, you know, and you could say there's little end in sight, there's potential tapering, but who knows? Mm -hmm. do, do you see that this has changed how, how the market has behaved over the past 20 years? Is there data supporting that? So I think it's... Uh... In my personal opinion, I think most definitely quantitative easing influences the way markets behave for the simple reason that um, the, the, the governments are buying very low yield fixed income securities from investors. So investors are very keen to give these securities away that basically give nothing, you know, the yield is so low in the securities, right? So they're buying, they're selling them to the, to the government. Now they have cash. So now they want to find something else to invest that is better. Okay, so what, uh, in, and this I think can create bubbles mm -hmm. because the money that people get from selling the securities to the government uh, has to be invested somewhere. So what they're, people are reaching for yield in some sense, right? So that's why we have seen, you know, we have gone through this like, you know, this uh, pandemic period that we see every single real indicator is sort of low, except the stock market that is super high. Right. So somehow there is a delinking between what the stock market is doing and what the real side of the economy is doing. And a lot of it has to be down to quantitative easing. Right. And these discussions, I mean, are not new. They are happening, you know, um, the, 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 in early 2000s, there was similar stuff, right, with, uh, you know, the discussion, are interest rates too low? And did that contribute to a bubble in, the, in, in other financial assets? So there were this same kind of discussions, you know, when Greenspan was in power and so on, was when, when he was the chairman. So, and, 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 and you know, so, so same things now. So not to say that quantitative easing, I guess, is not, uh, that, that is not useful as a tool. You know, obviously, they want to avoid the recession. And if you look further back in time, let's go, let's say, go back to the Great Recession, right? Like 1930s. That was a period where there was a, there was a bubble. The bubble burst. A lot of institutions were became insolvent, banks, and so on. There was no quantitative easing at that point. So they just, you know, the, the economy was just left to just recover. And it took decades. The, the, you know, at some point, the unemployment rate was like 40% in the, in the US. So I guess that is a lesson that people look, uh, you know, they've learned from this and they said, okay, in a similar case, we're going to try to cushion the market so that we don't have this type of effect, right? So they tried to do this with the, with the, with the um, you know, in the financial crisis onwards, I guess. Um, uh, but, you know, the, 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 the flip side is that it does create this incentive to reach for yield. 
and it does create this feeling of cheap money, you know. I think mm. what psychology becomes maybe kind of relevant here is that there is this cheap money thing, you know, like there you you can just borrow very at very low cost, and then you can just find something that has a positive expected return, and then you can just make a, a profit. But you know, uh, this can create bubbles, I think, and uh, you know, bubbles also have you know have negative things. So. And, and that's the difficulty of that the policymakers have. Obviously, quantitative easing is a tool that you can use to avoid the economy going into a recession. But on, but it also has some costs, which are the stuff that I just mentioned. So I think those have to be sort of balanced. But as you say, you know there is tapering. I mean, now they're saying, okay, we'll have seen already some 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 central banks have increased rates, and others have signaled that they will. So you know, I think there is this idea, okay, we'll have to move away from this, and that will lead to some correction, I think, to certain assets that perhaps their valuations are are are, are high. Yeah, I agree. And you could link this to, you know, you mentioned before the anti-establishment theme potentially that we've seen over the past five years in the US and the UK, parts of Europe. Um, and you can almost link it to, you know, if they don't do the QE and the economy goes bad, would there be further, you know, unrest and uprisings a lot, a lot worse in 2008? Do you think that could be a potential that we see or... Well, or do I don't you, think, yeah. uh, you know, that there is this economic risk in the current situation, right? I mean, now we, the main problem is COVID, but I think through the vaccinations and all this kind of stuff, you know, that going to be managed, I think. Yeah. Now, UK has the other thing of Brexit. I don't know how that will be managed. And that, that I think is a bigger risk going forward, right? I mean, people don't talk about it the last two years because we had COVID to worry about. Mm -hmm. But that is a bigger, is a risk that remains, you know? Now, um, whether QE is, is going to be needed I don't think so, unless some other kind of uh, event like the financial crisis happens to trigger this type of need. I, I think now the, what they are doing is how to best sort of go through to a trajectory with more normal sort of rates of return um, without shocking the market too much, you know, like managing the expectations. That's why they're, you know, the communication between uh, central banks and, and the markets is important. Like they say, okay, we, this is what we plan to do. So people already start to price it in and, you know, it doesn't come as a shock, like one day, okay, rates are up, uh, you know. So they're trying to sort of manage it. And I think the challenge is now how to do that. But I, I, yeah, I don't think the risk of a, of a recession due to this is very high. Yeah, I just definitely. think it might cause a correction somewhere, but you know, that's just a normal thing. Yeah, definitely. And what, you know, we, we link it, we say a shock, what would you say that, but, but you know, what happens in the shock? Do people just become completely rational? Cause I'm sure lots of people have studied, you know, you could say the uh, reset session in 2008 and the behavior behind it and why the markets went down so much, sort of what were the findings there? Yeah, so there, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, obviously, there was a credit crunch. I mean, the, you know, the reasons sort of going up to it, I mean, they were established, you know, with the housing yeah. bubble and all this kind yeah. of stuff. I mean, definitely psychology was relevant there. Now, afterwards, whether it was, uh, you know, the, the I, you know, I think it, it was a combination of perhaps some psychology, but also a lot of fundamentals, you know, there were yeah. just a lot of bad loans. Yeah. And a lot of securities that were rated incorrectly and a lot of people holding a lot of this, uh, you know, toxic assets in the portfolio. So, um, you know, when, uh, when the housing bubble burst, then all the assets that were linked to the housing bubble, you know, became uh, less valuable or totally worthless. So that created lots of problems on many, on the balance sheet of many people. And, you know, that created what it, uh, what it created so yeah i don't think it was all behavioral so okay so well you can almost compare it to let's say uh you know toilet paper shortage we had last year and then we were you know even the last week we've had the fuel shortage which is mm -hmm. you could say it's been they're saying it's not due to supply it's more due to the demand increase you know right. almost people panicking uh yeah. so you know i guess you is that something that's quite interesting that could potentially, you know, move to the stock market as well? We saw it almost uh, last year where people were panicking and, you know, they were selling, they were trying to get out of their, 
Yeah, yeah. No, it's panic selling is, also. in fact, uh, is a very good question. So panic selling is definitely something that people do, and it's something that definitely hurts their performance. So I've seen a recent study of a very large sample of individual investors, and they did show that, you know, the people that do panic selling, they sell at very low prices, obviously, because they sell at the bottom. And then they stay out for a long time, so they don't really capture the fact that the market tends to correct upwards afterwards. Okay, so you sell really low, the market then will just correct itself, you know, it will go up later on, but people don't, uh, don't uh, benefit from this. So definitely panic selling is something that, you know, does happen. And it does kind of relate to, if I, if I may make this point, to the initial uh, thing that we discussed about, you know, just putting your money in the stock market and just letting it there. You know, if you're not, you know, like observing the daily volatility of the market, if you're not a, a daily trader, is pointless you know it is pointless to see what the market is doing today and tomorrow if my objective is a 10-year horizon let's say you know and and if you do maintain a longer perspective you will avoid panic selling as well so we talked about it before but uh, i'll ask a question now so some financial professionals talk about the issues of academia uh and sort mm -hmm. of teaching students economic models that are known to be you know it's almost we were talking about before black and white that they, they don't include the gray they they don't actually apply yeah. in real life uh so yeah. what is your opinion on the statement yeah so i would disagree with this you know because i think um an economic so that, that, that is like a, a model by definition is going to be a simplification of reality right it cannot be that you build a model that accounts for every single factor and that model is going to be useless and the reason is that it's going to be useful, it's going to be so complicated that it would be impossible to make a prediction, right? Mm -hmm. So the model is useful because it provides some structure to a system and it allows you to make a prediction of what is going to, of what is going to happen. Now, economics and finance have been very successful fields because these theories are very well developed, okay? By developing a lot, the theory of rationality and the theory of efficient markets and knowing what those theoretical markets should look like, this provides a very good framework, a very good benchmark to actually think about the market, you know? So you know what the, what, what, what the market should do, right? So then you can observe what the market does. And then this comparison is gonna give you very good information about, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to analyze, right? So it is very important to understand very well these theories, okay? I do not subscribe at all to the idea that, you know, oh, we should just abandon all these theories. And then what do we study, you know? Like, what, what is the theory that is going to organize the way that you think, right? Because if you have a theory that tells you under assumption A, B, C, and D, this is the outcome. And then you observe some outcome that doesn't really uh, follow with this prediction, right? Then your natural sort of inclination is to say, okay, which of these assumptions doesn't hold, you know? So then you start to think maybe it's assumption A or B. So that allows you to better understand the world, right? If you didn't have this theory, you observe an outcome. Okay, so what does this outcome mean, you know? Should I be surprised by it? Is it expected? Who knows, right? So the theory is very important. So I do not agree with this idea. And also with the, you know, the, the fact that we should study these theories and understand them very well, because in any test that we do, is the null hypothesis, if you like, right? So you, you know, in order to test the null against something else, you have to, you know, understand what the null is doing. So yeah, uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that I think that for large part, you know, like the majority of the time, perhaps the market is, is working uh, according to those theories. Okay, mm -hmm. so the market is efficient for, you know, for the majority of time. That is my belief, okay? There are some cases that perhaps those theories break down. And of course, we'll have to study the dynamics, you know, like why, when do those things happen and behavioral finance can be helpful in this way. But, uh, you know, for uh, the market, most of the time is pricing information and incentives in the right way. So those theories are needed to understand, you know, those outcomes. Yeah, and I guess uh, as you said there, if, if something falls out of the theories, then you can look at it and potentially, you know, add, add on to what you already have. Exactly, and that's how knowledge. You know, you have a theory, you observe some for, uh, some uh, other outcome that you know you, you observe the theory is systematically violated. So you say, okay, let's just change this, and then we make a, we have a better theory. So you know, the theory is a live thing. It's not like uh, you know. Uh, 
yeah, it's like before, what we said before, black and white, you know, every, you know, it's, it's like people, we're all evolving, we're all changing, uh, <laughs> we're all building and developing. And it's the same as theories, you know, mm-hmm. over time, we'll see, yeah. learn more and more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So sort of, what do you see the future of finance? I don't know if that's something that, <laughs> is that something you focus on? Are you more analyzing the past? Is there anything that you can sort of theorize yeah. for the future? Um. Okay, interesting question, right? So, so what we do when we do, let's say, do research? I mean, you just you you have to analyze historical data, right? That's mm-hmm. the only data that you have. So, you know, we don't have access to future data, so we don't know. You know, we analyze historical data, and we try to find patterns in that historical data that can tell you something about how the market works. So, you know, by definition, you're looking at the, you're looking at the past. Now, finance, like any other academic area, I guess is, you know, it changes, but it changes slowly because it's dominated by people and people's views don't change very much. Really, the practice of something can change when people become replaced and younger people come with different kinds of ideas, you know? Mm-hmm. So, for example, in my generation, there were some kind of additions or the changes to the way people uh, people think, you know. So there was, for example, this, uh, you know, with all the big data kind of explosion, you know, big data, you know, started mid 2000s and, you know, it's carrying on today, even in more sort of complicated ways. So that was a new addition. People came out and said, OK, but let's just not just look at historical prices and historical volumes and try to understand, analyze those, which is what finance has been doing for 50 years. But let's try to look for information elsewhere, you know, like Google searches or Twitter feeds or, you know, texture analysis of newspaper articles. So that was like an explosion of like new stuff came out, right? Like new ways to measure things. Mm-hmm. That was exciting. Now we have the machine learning, uh, you know, revolution. Yeah. People are really into this, even though those techniques were there 20 years ago, right? So I remember, in fact, I had a friend, still my friend. He was doing neural networks in like beginning of 2000. And I remember he was trying to explain to me what the neural network is and all this kind of stuff. Somehow he wasn't very successful, you know, like they didn't publish those things very well at that time because, you know, it was just a sort of, it wasn't, now it's the mainstream. People are just much more interested in it, you know? Mm-hmm. But anyway, there's a lot of like uh, technologies also, software and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, there are these, uh, you know, exciting kind of new applications. So I think in the future, finance is going to be a lot more data driven, you know? So as these tools become more, uh, you know, they, 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 that, that there will be a lot more of this kind of uh, big data kind of uh approaches to the way people you know conduct research yeah i guess we've seen that with some of the most successful hedge funds using the the data and but you could almost say as well it's becoming you know it's, it's spreading to the retail traders as well you know retail traders have more data than they've ever had before and i, I guess the main issue is just trying to analyze it and, and understand it and yeah. That, yeah, that can be a, a, a curse and a blessing for, <laughs> for, for retail investors having more data. Now, hedge fund managers, absolutely, that's what they're doing, uh, you know, using machine learning and trying to basically predict security returns. I mean, this is what they are doing. This is what they have always been doing, actually, machine learning, except that, you know, now they have, uh, uh, you know, there's more data, there's more, there's more competition as well, which yeah. makes it even harder, right, to find those those opportunities and do you see this adding to the potential risk of the market because we've seen sort of flash crashes over the past 10 years where these machine learning you know algorithms they all sell at the same time they all buy at the same time and you know you've seen it go down five to, i think it's five six percent in yeah. a matter of minutes do you think that could happen well i think it happened uh, i don't think it's a systematic source of risk that people should worry about okay Uh, you know, that uh, they can cause, you know, some sort of, I don't think, I mean, it happened once or twice, I don't know, but, uh, you know, I don't think it's a big source of of risk. Now, the issue of competition is is an important issue because, you know, there's more managers trying to find profit opportunities. So by definition, there's going to be less profit opportunities. So what does this mean for people who put their money into these funds? That is... Question. Yeah, perfect. So, Costas, thank you so much for doing the podcast today. Uh, okay. My last question: What is one message you'd like listeners to take away? Okay, my one message would be. 
Okay, so we're talking about uh, people who are trying to achieve better, uh, you know, better portfolios, right? So one message, uh, at least from a behavioral point of view, as an as a, as a person that has been studying this stuff for, for a long time, I would say the most important thing for investors is to understand who they are as people first before they go to the stock market, you know? So if you are a person that is anxious, if you're a person that, you know, doesn't cope with uncertainty very well, Definitely being a day trader is not the thing for you, right? You're just going to have a lot of stress for no point. Uh, you know, why do you want to complicate your life like this, right? So I understand your personality, understand your, your objectives, you know? So my objective is, for example, to have some savings to, let's say, pay for my kid that will go to university in, I don't know when, like in, you know, 15 mm -hmm. years time. So, you know, have these type of objectives well formulated. So then this will allow you to say, okay, this is how I should interact with the stock market. So a lot of the time people enter the stock market, they don't really know themselves, then they become anxious. And, and, and this can have, you know, real implications for your, for your welfare. You know, if you, you know, you don't want to be stressed, you don't want to make bad decisions that is going to just hurt you. So yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. Someone uh, I interviewed recently said it's a very expensive place to learn who you are. <laughs> okay, stock well. market. <laughs> That is basically exactly what I'm trying to say. The same, yeah, perfect. Uh, so, Costas, thanks again. If anyone had any questions or anything, is there anywhere they could contact you? Or... Yeah, so um, uh, my information is on the website of uh, Work Business School. If you just Google my name, you'll find me there. My email is there. So, yeah, if anyone has anything to say or to ask, just welcome to send an email, yeah. Perfect, Costas, thanks again. All right, thank you, Anthony. Take care. You too. Thank you so much for listening and if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you are leaving with some great value about investing, trading and finance. See you on the next show.